Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be in uh, to open this conference. The Money Market Conference is a prominent event in our calendar. It is difficult to overstate the importance of understanding money markets for the design and implementation of monetary policy. Money markets are a seismograph for central bank liquidity, uh, central bank liquidity conditions, and for market expectations of future policy. While, of course, money market rates are central to the transmission of monetary policy through their impact on economy wide financing conditions. In recent weeks, there's been volatility in money markets around the world as traders work to absorb the implications of the recent increase in inflation rates for central bank policy decisions. At the ECB, our decision making is guided by our new monetary policy strategy as demonstrated by the revision of our interest rate forward guidance that we decided in July. A central element in our monetary policy strategy is the principle that if the economy is close to the effect of lower bound, it is necessary to adopt especially forceful or persistent monetary policy action to avoid that negative deviations from the inflation target become entrenched. Despite the high current inflation rate, the analysis indicating that the euro area is still confronted with weak medium term inflation dynamics remains compelling. In particular, the backdrop of the adverse demand shocks and positive supply developments during the, during the pre pandemic period, in which inflation averaged just 0.9% per year between 2014 and 2019, has had a persistent impact on price and wage setting dynamics. In 2020, the inflation rate further declined to 0.3% on account of the initial adverse pandemic shock to the economy and inflation. So the euro area has been confronted for an extended period with extensive slack and weak medium term aggregate demand conditions, which is also reflected in the chronically large aggregate current account surplus of the euro area. While fiscal policy has been forcefully counter cyclical during the pandemic, including through the launch of the innovative Next Generation EU initiative, the, the capacity of fiscal policy to support ag aggregate demand dynamics over the medium term is constrained by high aggregate national debt levels and the absence of a permanent central fiscal capacity. These factors reinforce our strategic assessment that extensive monetary accommodation is required to ensure that, ensure that inflation pressure builds up on a persistent basis in order to stabilize inflation at 2% over the medium term. So how do we reconcile the current high inflation rate and the subdued prospects for inflation over the medium term? Our analysis points to three temporary factors that, that are acting to push up inflation today, but are projected to fade over the course of next year. First, the pandemic initially exerted powerful downward pressure on inflation. In part, this was due to the severe drop in the economic activity during 2020. In part, in part, some policy measures directly contributed to lower inflation in 2020, especially the temporary VAT cut, cut, cut in Germany. So um, given the backdrop of 2020, the economic recovery during 2021 and the termination of temporary tax cuts has operated in the opposite direction temporarily pushing up the inflation rate after having temporarily pushed down the inflation rate in 2020. In particular, the base effect of unusually low prices during 2020 has contributed to higher inflation during 2021. But the 2020 unusually low prices will fall out of the inflation calculation, which compares prices today with prices 12 months ago at the end of this year. In terms of individual factors, the reversal of the temporary German VAT cut is a quantitatively important component that will no longer feature in the data in the new year. Second, the second factor is that inflation pressures related to bottlenecks can in part be attributed to the, attributed to the unexpectedly strong European and global recovery from the pandemic shock. So if we go back to the start of the pandemic, in the June 2020 Euro system staff macro projections, it was foreseen that Euro area GDP this year in 21 would be four percentage points below the 2019 level. 
in the most recent forecast in this, in September, uh, now the, the shortfall in 2021 for the year area is only 1.8 percentage points below the 2019 level. Globally, if we look at the June 2020 uh, World Economic Outlook, the IMF, the forecast at that time was that in uh, 2021, world GDP would be barely above the 2019 level, just at a 20 basis point differential. Whereas uh, now in the October 21, we owe a uh, global output this year is 2.6 percentage points above the 2019 level. So uh, whether at the European or global level, uh, we have a level of uh, recovery you know, far in advance of what was expected um, uh, 15 months ago, maybe when some, when some supply capacity decisions were made. So the fact that the performance is much stronger than initially expected, which can be attributed to the success of vaccination campaigns and other public health measures, together with extensive policy support around the world. But a byproduct of the unexpectedly strong recovery is that there have been extensive demand supply mismatches in the global markets for commodities and manufactured goods, uh, which of course have been exa exacerbated by some sector specific supply disruptions, including in the semiconductor industry. There are also mismatches in some segments of domestic labor markets, especially in those services sectors that suffered the most from the severe lockdowns, but are now experiencing high demand, uh, such as in the hospitality sector. However, the, the nature of such bottleneck, ne bottleneck induced inflation is that is inherent temporary component. In particular, demand supply mismatches should be alleviated over time through the expansion of supply capacity, together maybe with some nor normalization demand patterns following the reopening. All else equal, if lack of supply is putting upward pressure on prices today, the introduction of extra supply over time will operate in the opposite direction as an anti-inflationary force. The expansion of supply capacity can also be expected in domestic labor markets through, through the reversal of the pandemic-related drop in the labor force participation rate and the return of, of the many international workers that had temporarily gone back to their home countries. Third, the largest single contributor to the currently high inflation rate has been the surge in energy prices. While energy inflation has been influenced by both base effects, since energy prices dropped sharply in 2020, and bottleneck effects, demand supply mismatches have been extensive for both oil and natural gas. The contribution of, en of energy to overall inflation is typically stronger in the near term than in the medium term, also due to the adverse macroeconomic impact of high energy prices. In particular, since the euro area is a significant net importer of energy, and increasing global energy prices constitutes a negative terms of trade shock, depressing the net revenues of European firms and the disposable income of European households. This adverse aggregate demand channel means that an, an energy price shock can simultaneously raise headline inflation, but all else equal exert downward pressure on the path of underlying inflation. So taken together, these three factors, base effects, bottleneck effects, and, uh, and energy prices, explain why inflation is temporarily high, and at the same time provide solid reasons to expect inflation to decline through the course of next year. So in, the, in relation to the connection between uh, this inflation analysis and our interest rate policy, it is always necessary to keep in mind that monetary policy affects the inflation rate only with a considerable lag. In particular, an abrupt tightening of monetary policy today would not lower the currently high inflation rates, but would serve to slow down the economy and reduce employment over the next couple of years, and thereby reduce medium-term inflation pressure. So given our assessment that the medium-term inflation tra trajectory rem remains below our 2% target, it would be counterproductive to tighten monetary policy at the current juncture. In particular, our new forward guidance specifies three conditions that need to be met before we would start raising our policy rates. The first condition is that the governing council sees inflation reaching 2% well ahead of the end of its projection horizon. The second condition is that the 2% target is reached durably for the rest of the projection horizon. And the third condition is the governing council judges that realized progress on underlying inflation 
is sufficiently advanced to be consistent with inflation stabilizing at 2% of the medium term. So with regard to temporarily high inflation, the requirement that we need to see inflation reaching 2%, not only well ahead of the end of our projection horizon, but also durably for the uh, rest of the projection horizon, ensures that interest rate policy will not, will not react to inflation shocks that are expected to fade away before the end of our projection horizon, which of course will include 2024 in the December round. Moreover, the condition that realized progress in underlying inflation is sufficiently advanced to be consistent with, infl with inflation stabil stabilizing at 2% over the medium term serves as a, an important purpose in our analysis of the incoming data. It sharply differen differentiates between the volatile components of headline inflation and the dynamics of underlying inflation, which is the persistent component that is the best guide to medium term inflation dynamics. Now, of course, in assessing underlying inflation, it is critically important to filter out the temporary effects, the temporary impact of base effects and bottlenecks on goods inflation and services inflation. Uh, uh, this is a, clearly a, a challenge right now. In any event, the persistent component in wage dynamics will be central in the assessment of underlying inflation, especially in view of the high share of services in the overall price level and the high share of labor and services value added. Accordingly, tracking wage outcomes, of course, adjusted for productivity and differentiating between transitory and persistent components in wage settlements will be pivotal in assessing progress in the realized path of underlying inflation. In particular, a one-off shift in the level of wages as part of the adjustment to a transitory unexpected increase in the price level, which is what we're seeing this year, does not uh, in itself imply a trend shift in the path of underlying inflation. Now, of course, in addition to rate forward guidance, the calibration of asset purchases also plays a major role in, in ensuring that the monetary stance is sufficiently accommodated to deliver the timely attainment of our 2% target in the medium term. In particular, the compression of term premia through the duration extraction channel is quantitatively significant in determining longer term yields and ensure, ensuring that financing conditions are sufficiently supportive to be consistent with the delivery of our medium term inflation objective. Finally, it is vitally important that the ECB is always attentive to the full risk distribution of possible outcomes rather than focusing solely on the baseline assessment. In our latest monetary policy meeting, meeting, we assess that in the near term, supply bottlenecks and rising energy prices are the main risks to the pace of recovery and the outlook for inflation. So if supply shortages and higher energy prices last for longer, uh, these factors can slow down the recovery. At the same time, if persistent bottlenecks feature into higher than an anticipated wage rises, or the economy returns more quickly to full capacity, price pressures could become stronger. However, uh, in terms of upside, economic activity could also outperform our expectations if consumers become more confident and save less than currently expected. So we will be continually reassessing these risk factors in line with incoming data flows. So with that, uh, let me again uh, uh, reiterate uh, Luke's welcome and uh, wish you the best for I'm sure it's going to be a very nice conference over the next two days. Uh, so uh, uh, back to you.